in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and it was good. Welcome to Untethered with Jake Johnson. Enjoy the ride. What's up, everybody? Jake Johnson here. Untethered. How you doing? Good to see you. It's a WYSIWYG Wednesday. Call up some friends. Get them on over here. Let's have a party. Let's show them how it's done in the South. We're going to be talking about all kinds of things today. <clears throat> We're going to be doing some music. We're going to be delving into the inner sanctum of the psyche. It's going to be fun. Let's see if there's anybody watching yet. Two people. All right. There's two whole people here. Y'all need to chill out. By all means, make some noise. Let's have some fun. I have been battling the worst case of laryngitis I've ever had. It's not so bad that I've lost my voice, but it just will not let me go. It's right there, and it just keeps hanging on. So, if I'm scratchy today, that's why. <clears throat> Every time I cough, it's like, eh, it might get better. Nope, it's not getting better. Please, if you have a song you'd like to hear, shout it out. I'll be glad to play it for you. I'm actually working on a way to put a song list up so you can write, you know, exclamation point song list in the chat and it'll pop up a list of all the songs that I play. I haven't got it working yet, but I'm trying. Like, subscribe, and share this video on Facebook and all your other platforms. Let's see if we can't get a revolution started. See if we can't get something going on. I'm excited. I'm ready to do it. Oh. Little Miss Beauty here with me today. <laughs> Got a nice fire raging. Children shouldn't play with fire, but adults can. It is WYSIWYG Wednesday. Two points. Anybody can tell me what that means. Thank you. 
I don't know what I'm talking about. Holler it out. You guys got something you want to hear? I'll try it. I have no problem making a jackass of myself for your entertainment. <laughs> I thought Monday's podcast went quite well. I'm open to any feedback. <clears throat> any ideas? After all, I'm trying to create something here that everybody can enjoy. Like Mr. Rogers putting on my new shoes. Well, I can see. What we got in here so far? If you're in the chat, holler out. Say hello. Yeah. I'm enjoying this cigarette and some coffee while I wait for everybody to show up. Got my nice little uh, stainless steel mug. Keeps my coffee nice and hot. A little bit later on, we're going to be talking about time, space, and matter. We're going to talk about the intricacies of time and how it got here and what it means. We're going to talk about secrets in the Bible, the way that uh, words are used. We're going to talk about Einstein. We're going to talk about Genesis. Hey, Rachel, how are you doing? We're going to talk about ancient cosmologies. I seem to be missing a picture. Where would it be? No, that's not it. Whoa! I'll just leave that alone for right now. Scary. Get me all over the place. <clears throat> What'd you think of last time's podcast, Rachel? I thought it went well. How's Mr. Gray Sky doing this afternoon? The trolliest of them all. Can you hear me okay? Is there a lag? Last time we did this, there was a bit of a lag, and it seemed like I'd say something, and 10 seconds later, somebody would respond to it. So I could never tell if it was coming in right on the money or if I had to wait to see if anybody was paying attention or not. I think that had to do with the internet, though. Mood started. Hey, down in Louisiana, up where the green grass grows. Hey, I played in California, up where the old river flows. Cause I'm a random man. Oh, 
spoke with She got a daughter on mine She got a heart like a steel Just like a thief in the night She got a slow burning fire She keep it ready on the floor I never get on Delbert McClinton for you. Tom Petty is a good choice. Thank you. 
I'm petty for you. Good choice. That's a great song. You lost your phone? Oh no! Well, how are you talking to me now? Speaking of phones, as soon as you said I lost my phone, my phone dinged. Weird. Took my capo off, and now my guitar is all out of whack. They don't like it.
top Betty for you. So you found your phone, right? It's all good in phone town. It's all good in the neighborhood. That's wonderful. Where is uh where is uh T Bone at? I haven't seen her in a few podcasts. Starting to feel like she's left me. I don't even know her. And flesh bone fle- flesh man, where is he at where is he at today? He might be here. He might be hiding in the back somewhere.
some coat forward. Little mud diggers. I see how it is. You guys get to play in a video game and forget all about old Jake. I don't blame you. I'd be doing it too. How about them Braves? Anyone in particular? Do you have a favorite David Allen Coe song? you were after you were wanting something like uh from 
Montgomery had my guitar on my back when a stranger came up beside me in an antique Cadillac. He was dressed like 1950, half bald and hollow eye. He said it's a long walk to Nashville, just like a ride, son. Sit down in the front seat, turn on the radio. Them sad songs coming out of them speakers was Jake Johnson band Solid Gold. When I noticed a stranger was ghost white pale when he asked me for a light, I knew there was something strange about this guy. He said, Drifter, can you make folks cry when you play the same? that Cadillac. I said, hey, mister, many thanks. He said, you don't have to call me mister, mister. Nice hot cup of coffee here. What are we looking like? Like nobody's watching me. Nobody knows what they're doing. All right. Well, it's one of those days, let me tell you.
time I ask about it. I understand. I know how it is. Sun goes down on my side of town. The lonesome feeling comes through my door. The whole world turns blue. There's a rundown bar across the railroad tracks. Table for two, way in the back where I sit alone. get on to the other thing. You guys having fun?
Thompson Square that I forgot the last half of. <laughs> That's all right. When has anything like knowing the words ever stopped a fella before? Whoa. mountain music for you. How much longer are you locked down? Until the government says I can get up, I guess. I have no idea. Last I heard, we're still on a, uh, you know, voluntary Yes, at home. Things different in Georgia? They letting y'all up down there? Well, I was out in town today and I saw a car drive my way and I said, hey, is that a 57 Chevy? I looked a little closer and said, no, they didn't paint those red. That's a 49 DeVille coming our way. Well, I wish I learned the words of this song. That way I could do more than just sing along and people would think I knew what I was doing out here. But that just ain't the way old Jake Johnson's style. He's going to do it anyway for a while. And if you like it, you'll listen. And if you don't, you won't. This here song's about a hot rod in Lincoln. And one day I might get to thinking and make up some stuff that actually goes with the words. But until then, I'll just keep on rambling, and things won't be quite as ambling, and uh, I will just sit here and ramble on. Anyway, though music's kind of my thing, I like to talk a little and show my way. You know, sometimes I get crazy on the podcast. Anyway, I'm about to change my gears and do a little thing over there, and I can't remember any more words that remind me where I'm with gear. So I guess I'll quit while I'm ahead. Go ahead and plan ahead. Maybe I can say head one more time. You know how hard it is to come up with words on the spot? Like you're, you know, from Star Trek and you're Dr. Spock. And people think you got some intelligence rambling around between your ears. But that's not the case, I guarantee, because I'm just a country boy from McGee. And one of these days, I'm going to write a song that makes sense. There you go. All right.
Wow, that was painfully embarrassing. I hope you enjoyed it. Sometimes I like to write songs on the spot, and sometimes it works out. Sometimes it don't. <clears throat> so, last Monday, I introduced the idea that I was going to start rambling on about some, you know, deeply interpersonal things and history and so forth, science and religion and politics and, you know, all the stuff you're not supposed to discuss. Well, I'm going to discuss it because I like that kind of thing. And uh, I had somebody ask me off air. They said, uh, aren't you worried about getting a little preachy? And I said, well, no, if they were paying attention, they heard me say very clearly, I'm not trying to preach to you. I'm not trying to convert you. But in order to discuss this subject, there's certain things you have to accept. And one of them is there is a creator and it has a lot to do with the Bible. That's where most of the correct history is written anyway. So I can't really talk about it without talking about those things. But if you don't believe in God, that's your business. You can still learn a thing or two or, or confirm what you already know or whatever. Or you can decide that I'm absurdly wrong and you just have got to tell me. So you can do that too. That's fine. Uh, I'm just a man. I'm capable of making mistakes and I'm capable of learning just like anybody else is. So what I'm saying is we might be discussing some subjects that get very heavy into the religious side of things. But it's not like I'm trying to preach to you. In fact, the closest I'll ever come to that is reading something out of the Bible because it backs up the point I'm trying to make. Uh, I didn't write the Bible. I'm not telling you to read it. So I don't know I don't know how to make you feel right about that other than listen or don't. It's up to you. But I'm going to talk. So here we go. The first thing I'm going to talk about is space, time, and matter. There's this thing that happens when uh, let's see if I can get this right. In the 1800s, there was a meeting held in Cambridge, and the professors of the time got together and they decided that they were going to do away with God. The reason they were going to do that is because they were disgusted by the idea that there is a creator and that they would be held accountable for their actions. They didn't like that at all, so what they decided to do was do away with God. And they set forth in creating notions about things that pertain to science that ordinarily would have everything to do with religion, because I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but science was started by religious people. The first thousand years of science or more was done by the church. It wasn't until the 1800s that that changed and it became an academic thing rather than a religious thing. There are some bad actors on both sides of this. Uh, during the Inquisition, some strange things happened. Some people were on house arrest and some people got burned at the stake for saying things like the earth goes around the sun rather than the other way around. That guy didn't have a good day after he reported that and he ended up recanting and he spent the rest of his life on house arrest because of it. And then they've embraced it a hundred or so years later, two hundred years later, they embraced the idea and pardoned the guy long after he was dead. And so you have things like that that happen. And there's not really anything you can do about it except live and learn. And now, Science will say that there was a Big Bang. The Big Bang was invented by a guy. Let's see if I can pull it up. Where'd it go? I just had it. There you go. Edwin Hubble. In 1929, American astronomer Edward Hubble, Edwin Hubble, came to the conclusion that... Uh, Doppler shifting, what that means is, is when you look up in the sky and you see stars and they've got a red tint to them, they assume that means Doppler shift. 
what a Doppler shift is is when something's moving away from you the light spectrum changes and the light that you're receiving from it turns red much like when an ambulance drives by and you hear the sound it goes Wah! you know that's the Doppler effect they assume that that's what's happening in the sky I say that's not what's happening in the sky and they're using that as an excuse let me prove it to you this is a star you see that what color is it it's white right now what color is it can you see it with all my lights on it's red you probably can't see it because of the lights in the room but do it yourself get a flashlight Ooh and stick your hand over it and you'll notice that the light coming out between your fingers is red that's because there's something in front of the light skewing it well you call that the Doppler shift I call it dust in space so what I'm saying is is the stars are not moving they have things in between us and them space is not empty you can do it hey T-Bone what's happening I've been looking for you You can uh, do all the research you want to do, and you're going to find out that everyone in the scientific community says that the Big Bang happened, and everything started from nothing, and boom, there was everything, and then it's rapidly expanding. And the idea is, is that it will expand so far and then contract and then do it again. Expand and contract, expand and contract. I don't know how they come to that conclusion since they've never actually seen it happen before and never will see it happen because... That was a long time ago. Nobody was alive when it happened. So all of these things are just postulations from people that are no smarter than you and I coming up with theories that make absolutely no sense at all. And I say go with Occam's razor. Occam's razor is the notion that the simplest answer is usually the right answer. Not always, but it's a good rule of thumb to start there anyway. And the simplest answer for redshift is there's dust in the sky. Prove me wrong. The stars are right where they've always been. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Einstein was wrong. Uh, Einstein postulated a theory that the speed of light is a certain number and there's a certain uh, correlation between light and gravity and dark energy and all of that stuff that came out of that study. All of these things are excuses. They're just more and more things piled on to explain things as they get further and further and deeper and deeper into the hole that they dug for themselves with the Big Bang. Now, what we live in is a universe. You can tell what a thing is by the name it's given. And you can look, you can look up the etymology of certain words and transliterate those words into different meanings but usually a word is named the thing because it makes sense for example universe uni verse that means a single spoken word or phrase or sound or utterance in the beginning was the word the Word was with God and the Word was God. He spoke and things happened. Now you can find a deeper meaning in that saying that a speech, an utterance, is a vibration or a set of vibrations. And depending on the frequency of those vibrations, you get any manner of sounds, one of which being music. This is an A, a string that is the A note. It is vibrating at 440 hertz. That is a standard A. If you put two more notes with it, you get an A chord. Right? A chord is a stack of thirds. If you look at a musical scale from C that way and C that way, you know, down and up, 
it goes to infinity in both directions, or at least as far as we've been able to measure. The, the scale of music goes forever. But if you put every third note together, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you get a stack of thirds. And those thirds make up a chord. So you get a note, and then three notes make a chord. A, C, and E, I believe, is in the key of A. Maybe A, E, and D. I can't remember. My music theory is a little off. Anyway, you can say that God is music. That it's been music from the very beginning. Even the stars sing. The Bible talks about angels singing, and it makes a correlation between the angels in heaven and the stars in heaven. That could be metaphor, but it could also be a correlation of the two. So what I'm saying is vibration started this whole thing. There was nothing, no time, no space, no matter, but there was vibration. And from that vibration, everything came into existence. Now, the Bible starts out with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the first line. There is more information in that first line than anywhere else in any book in the whole of the world. God, being the creator, created the heavens, which is space, and the earth, which is matter, and he did it during a time. He created time, space, and matter in the first sentence. That's what science is calling the Big Bang because they don't have a better thing to call it. Where they say that nothing exploded and then everything came out of that. Well, if you look at the laws of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics is that everything tends towards chaos. That's true. If you don't believe me, look in the mirror. You'll see that chaos is definitely abound. So, if everything tends towards chaos, meaning that everything decays, everything falls apart, everything stops working, everything disintegrates over time, that means that the key ingredient here is time. Time is what starts it, and then you die over time. But there was no time when God was here first. God created time, which means he's outside of time. So if God's outside of time, then he can look at time like I'm looking at this coffee cup. He can see the whole of it. He can see the existence of it all in one spot. And he can manipulate it to his will, which is a hard thing for us to understand because everything we've ever known has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But outside of that, in the infinity, there is no beginning, middle, or end. It's all the same thing. It never stops. It's always there. It always has been there. It always will be there. That's a tough thing to, to wrap your head around because infinity is not native to human beings. It's not something we can grasp. So God created this universe. The etymology of the word universe derives from an old French word, univers. I got to be smoking. Univers. Fuck you, I don't care. Yeah. It also derives from the Latin word universum, the Latin word that was used first by Cicero. He authored many books, Cicero. You can check some of those out. Some of them have been translated into modern English. The term universe among the ancient Greek philosophers, like Pythagoras and onwards, was a word called topan, which means the all. Defined as all matter of time and space. Toholin, which means all things in Greek, which did not necessarily include the void, the void being space in its entirety. Another synonym 
was Hokosmos, which is where we get our word cosmos, meaning the world or everything in the world. Synonyms also found in Latin, totem, mundus, and natura, which is where we get our word nature from. German words include das all, wetfall, and natur for the word universe. Synonyms found in English, such as the theory of everything, meaning the cosmos, as in cosmology, This is a Greek or ancient Hebrew cosmology. Take a good look at that. This is a description of the earth as they knew it for thousands and thousands of years before the days of Copernicus and, and uh, all those guys. before Hubble, before Pythagoras. This is what the Flat Earthers get their cosmology from, by the way. I'll answer that question in a little while, too. As you can clearly see, at the very top, there's God and the heavens and the heavens of the heavens, which there should be three levels of heaven, according to the Bible. Below that is the firmament, where there's water above and water below. That was destroyed during the flood, changing our atmosphere forever. Below that is the sky, which is where the birds fly. Anything above terra firma, above the dirt, is considered the firmament. But there's different levels of the firmament. Below that is the earth and the sea, the mountains, which were not there at one time. When the flood happened, you notice on either side of that landmass there's a crack and then more land. Well, if you'll drain the oceans, you'll notice that there's a seam around the earth, kind of like a baseball. On our side of the world, it's called the Marianas Trench. There's a name for it on the other side, too, but I can't remember what it is. That's where the waters broke from the deep and came out. They came out with such force that they shot up into space, breaking the firmament that was above. The ice or water that was above the earth came down. People said, well, where did all the water go if the flood happened? Well, there it is. At one time, all of the earth was one land mass. After the flood, it was separated into several land masses, and oceans appeared. Well, the oceans are the water that used to be under the earth. Now it's in the earth. See that place where it says Sheol? That is where the water was. And now it's on the outside. And then below that's what they call the Great Deep. The Great Deep is the ocean, of course. So there's your cosmology. That's the real earth that you live in right there in front of you. It's never changed and it never will. No matter how many globes they put in classrooms, that's what the earth looks like. And that's what the heavens look like. And that's what I look like. I really need a producer. Anybody want to be a producer? Flip a bunch of switches so I don't have to shift focus? Now, hang on one second. There. Einstein postulated a lot of math. And some of his math is right, some of it isn't right. Not in the sense that we live in a three dimensional world. This, this world is dynamic. He was sitting on a train watching parallax. What parallax is, if you've ever looked out a window of a moving car, you look down by the road and the grass and the ditches are moving by real fast, and then you look out across the field and the trees are moving by real slow. You got fast moving, 
slow moving. That's called parallax. That's the the illusion that time is moving in a different speed the further you are away from the thing you're looking at. That's not the correct definition of parallax, but that's what it means. And he was watching parallax, and he happened to notice these things, and he decided to explain it mathematically. And from that came the inspiration for him to write the theory of relativity. And then he wrote the theory of special relativity, which has to do with light speed. As long as you're looking at it on paper, on in a two-dimensional way, his math works. But the minute you add that third dimension and add time to it, it no longer works. As a matter of fact, they've done studies at Caltech, among other places, where they've actually slowed the speed of light down to zero, meaning they froze a photon in, mo in motion. Well, there's the evidence right there. The speed of light is not constant. That's also assuming that it's always traveled at the same speed. How do you know that when the universe was created before the flood, that light didn't travel faster than it does now or slower? Same thing with carbon dating. That's assuming that carbon is always decayed at the same rate into carbon-14. There's a certain amount of carbon-14 in our atmosphere to start with just because there's a sun and the sun beats down on the earth. But when something dies, the amount of carbon-14 that's in it kind of stops right where it's at. And you can measure that. And from that, you can get a relative idea of its age based on the amount of carbon-14 in the object. But that's only if the amount of carbon-14 has been standard from the beginning. If it all it has ever changed, then that date means absolutely nothing, which is why we have a problem with dates in this world. You know what A.D. and B.C. means? Anno Domini and before Christ. But now they've got a thing called B.C.E., which is the technical scientific term for before Christ because they don't want to say Christ. So they say B.C.E., and I can't remember what that stands for, but you can Google it. And then you'll read the Bible, and the Bible will say, well, there's steps that lead into Zion, and they're right at the edge of Jerusalem. And you'll go to Jerusalem, and you'll see a set of steps right outside of Jerusalem and nothing above it. Because the Bible also says that every stone of that temple would be raised to the ground, which means it no longer stands. That whole city is gone. It's, it's been wiped off the face of the earth. But the steps leading up to it is still there today. You can go there right now and see it. And then you get some panty waist scientist that goes, oh no, 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 no. The dates are all wrong. This is 200 years out of place. This can't be Zion. It doesn't match up with the time period in which Zion existed. Here's a thought. Take your date and move it 200 years to the right and you'll see that everything lines up perfectly. They did that so that you couldn't go to a site and point at it and say, this is it. This is the thing the Bible was talking about because it doesn't match up, doesn't fit the time period. But the problem isn't the object, the problem is the time period. Change that and everything works like it's supposed to. It's right where everything it says it is. There's a part in the Bible that talks about an oasis with 14 palm trees lined in a row. You can Google search it right now, it's there right where the Bible says it is. You can trace it back in the guy's footsteps from where he left to where he ended up and you'll find that oasis right in the middle, right where it says it is. Every word that I have ever looked up in the Bible has all been true, all of it, except for the things that you cannot prove, like the existence of God, for example, or a burning bush. No, I've never seen that. But every other word in the Bible that I can test has proven out to be factual. That's why I trust that book. And unless I find something that, if there's one word that's a lie, I'll never trust it again. But there's not. I know because I've looked. I ain't taking somebody's word for it. I actually looked. So it is the most accurate history book we have. So if you're a history buff like I am and you like to know about things of the past, start there. All the other books were written by people who won the wars and it is tainted with the propaganda that they want you to know about. 
All history is written that way, except for the Bible. That's the only one that's non-biased. It tells you what happened. Now, there's going to be people that will tell you that there's contradictions in the Bible. No, there's not. There's people who don't know how to read. There's people that don't have patience. But there's no contradictions in the Bible. Not one. There was a certain verse that was talking about horses and stables, and this is one that people like to point to quite often. You like this shirt? Thank you very much. It's pretty pretty badass, ain't it? <clears throat> anyway, this verse is talking about horses and stables. And I'm paraphrasing because I don't have the Bible in front of me and I don't remember the exact verse, but it's something like there were 300 stables and only 30 horses. And then in the next verse, it says there were 300 stables and 30 horses. And a guy points at it and he says, see, the numbers don't add up. They, they contradicted themselves. I said, no. You can have 300 stables and not have them full of horses. You can have less horses than you have stables. You can't have more horses than stables unless you keep some of them out of town. Because the way they did it in those days is the stables would be built onto the house. So the whole complex would be there in one spot. House, stables, so forth and so on. Place to keep your animals, other animals, like livestock and whatnot. So this particular verse is talking about... Start, hey, how are you? That's a new name. TWI Animations. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. And scroll back a little bit, you get to listen to some good music. Scroll forward a little bit, and you get to hear the answers to the universe. It's up to you. Please do like, subscribe, and share this video with people you love and people you hate. And let's get it going. Anyway, the point, long and short of the point I was making is that if you read carefully, you will discover, much to your dismay, I'm sure, that the Bible does not in fact contradict itself, but it's worded in such a way that would make you think that if you just glance over it, but you have to really pay attention to what you're reading. Okay, done with that. When Moses spoke to God in the burning bush. Moses was told to go to the Israelites and tell them who he was and that they should follow him into the desert. And Moses, being the kind of guy he was, wasn't a very good speaker, and he asked God, he said, Who am I? How can I tell these people to follow me? They're not going to believe me. After all, I did just leave there. God said to them, Tell them I am sent you. I'm paraphrasing. And what he said was, I am that I am. Now, what you don't know is, is this was a secret word that was forbidden to be spoken amongst the Israelites. They would gather in corners and whisper about it, and they would have secret meetings where they would talk about this sort of thing. This is the God they worshipped. The I am. The great I am. Now, the reason they gathered in secret is because they were slaves at the time. They were slaves to the Israel, I mean, to the Egyptians, and it was against Egyptian law to do that in public. So they had to keep it a secret. At this time, they were carrying around a bunch of bones with them that they would gather around, and those were the bones of Abraham. And they kept it for a long time that way. And this was kind of their way of paying homage to the past and and uh, worshiping their God the way they saw fit. They knew. When Moses told them that I am sent me, that no Israelite would dare say that out loud because it was a forbidden word, and no non Israelite would even know about it. That's why he was told to say that particular phrase because it was a very secret thing that only the Israelites knew about, and they wouldn't say it out loud unless it was sent from the God directly, which it was. Now, fast forward 2,000 years into the future and you have Jesus standing there talking to the Pharisees and they ask him they said you're not even 30 years old how is it that we should listen to you about the wisdom of the world 
And Jesus said very clearly and very plainly in a direct sentence. He did not misspeak. He said, before Abraham was, I am. That sentence don't make any sense. That's not grammatically correct or even slang correct. That's a bad way to say a word. Unless you're saying something specific, which he was. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He's saying, I am God. That's his, he's making that declaration. A little bit later, you'll notice that they were trying to crucify him because he claimed to be God, which he never did. But he did right then. That's when he did it. And that's what they took from it. That's why it tripped him out when he said that. They didn't believe him because he's claiming to be God on earth right here, right now. That's 2,000 years after that other thing happened. You can't make that up. That happened more often than I care to admit when it concerns Jesus, which is why 2,000 years later, we're still talking about him because he did things like that that blew people away. Now, I defy you to write something down or have someone else write something down that you said and then ask them about it in a year and see if they can remember what it was that they wrote down. Yet we tout every word the man said over and over again in churches all over the world and in living rooms all over the world. We study it because it was important. Because this is the kind of event that does not happen every day. This is the kind of man that could speak and the whole world would listen forever. The reason I'm talking about this is because God promised in the book that there would always be an inspired word of God on this earth for us to refer to. That inspired word is the 1611 King James Bible. The reason I stipulate 1611 is because the newer ones kind of suck and they took some stuff out they shouldn't have taken out. The older the better when it comes to the King James Bible. There were 50 scholarly men, the highest in their field, that were brought to a location and locked in separate rooms, each one given a piece of the Bible and told to translate it to the best of their ability. And when they're finished, to pass it to the guy next door and have that guy check it. And when that guy's done, to pass that to the guy next door and have him check it. So 50 times this Bible went through translation, 50 times, to get it as close to correct as possible. And at the end, they even wrote a letter that used to be included in the Bible. It no longer is, but I have one that still has the letter in it where it says, hey, you know, we're people. We did the best we could under the circumstances, being locked in a room and all, but we did the best job we could do, but check it out for yourselves. Go look at a Strong's Concordance and see for yourself what the words mean if you don't believe us. But here's the best translation we can give you. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but that's exactly what they were talking about. Why is that important? Because you have to believe in something. If you don't believe in something, you believe in nothing. And no one should believe in nothing. Because that makes you brainless. It makes you dumb. You got to believe something. Even if it's your buddy next door, or if it's a book, or if it's a whatever. That notion has been hijacked by the academia of the world. And they put forth this theory capital S science for you to believe in and most people have started believing in it because if you tell a lie long enough even you'll believe it well these things are lies they're not right the people that wrote them knew they weren't right knew what they were doing when they wrote them it is a deception on the highest order now when you talk about the antichrist and you say well that's not going to affect me because he's not going to deceive me. Well, see, that's the thing about deception. It's deceiving. If it was easy to spot, it wouldn't be very deceptive. So the master plan is to infiltrate the world and put out this thing that does away with God entirely and then get everybody in the world to believe it. And I mean everything that you think you know is part of it from the day you were born on every television show 
in every movie, in every classroom, on every computer screen, all over the world, there's been this globe. Everywhere you look, there's a globe. And it's drilled into your brain so much so that you never even question it. You never even, you're not even curious because that's just the way it is. Except it's not. It's not the way it is at all. You live in a world that you've never seen before. And I bet you're thinking, oh shit, he's fixing to go flat earth on us. No, I'm not. The earth is not flat. It's not round either, but it's not flat. How do I know that? Because I have eyes. <clears throat> the earth that you live on is spheroidal. It's close to spherical, but it's not a sphere. It's not the pretty picture that you've seen all over your Apple iPhone or all over these calendars that are put out or whatever. It doesn't look like that at all. And there's a reason you've never seen it, by the way. It's a, a, a governmental reason. And you never will see it either. Unless you find a certain video that was made in the 40s, right when cameras were just starting to get popular. Then you might see a piece of it. But see, here's the big thing. You can't go high enough to actually see the curvature of the Earth. Your, your eyes can't contain it. Even if you were outside of a spaceship, sitting on the hood, going up, you would go blind before you ever saw the whole thing. You can't see it. It's just too big. It's a whole lot bigger than they're saying it is. The math does not add up. Eight inches per mile squared is the drop-off if you were looking straight out and the earth curved beneath you like so. The math would work out to eight inches per mile squared. That's squared every mile. Eight, sixteen, thirty-two, on and on and on. Uh, that's not right. That's not correct. And I can prove that physically. I can show it to you. It's not correct. So, why ever they ever put those numbers out is beyond me, but those numbers are not correct. That's not saying that the Earth is flat because it's not flat either. It's flat in places. As far as you're concerned, it's flat because all you will ever see is a three-mile radius of where you're standing at. You'll never see more than that. Even if you went up 20,000 feet, 60,000 feet, you're still going to see a flat level plane because that's all you can see. You physically can't see any further than that. There's a limit to how far you can see, even if it's unobstructed, which it's not. There's a lot of things in the way, a lot of atmosphere, there's a lot of dust, there's a lot of space, very nature of space distorts vision. So there's just absolutely, the fact that your eyes are round and that you bring in light from different angles and it's all translated into your brain into a picture, all of those things are reasons why you will never see the earth in its entirety. You can't. Not even if you had a picture of it. Which is why there are no real pictures of it. They're all CGI. They're all fake. There's no pictures of anything in space. Nothing. It's all fake. All of it. Everything NASA's ever put out. Everything China's ever put out. Everything uh, India has ever put out. Everything Europe has ever put out, everything Germany and Russia put out, it's all fake, every bit of it. Why? Well, because if you saw it, then you would know things, things you're not supposed to know. Things that could be devastating to a country who's trying to control you. Same thing with Antarctica. There's some fuckery going on in Antarctica. Believe that. The day that we had an election in 2016, was it 16 or 18? I can't remember. I think it was 16. The day we had the election, seven world leaders, including the Pope and John Kerry, all flew to Antarctica that day to have a meeting. That's on public record. That's a fact. It happened. Why? What's in Antarctica? 
Nothing according to science. You're not even allowed to go there. Yet people are going there. So, all, what I'm saying, all these things are connected. They're all, everything is connected. It's going to take a long time for me to unravel it. It's going to take a lot of little topics here and there and a lot of stream of consciousness type conversation like this one is for me to put it all together for you. And eventually I'll, I'll get there. You just got to hang on and, and join me with it. I'm going to take you on a fascinating journey through a lot of things. Through the fact that dinosaurs aren't real. Not the way you know them anyway. They, they existed, but they're not real the way you know them. Uh, I'm going to take you through Bible codes. Did you know that if you took the first five books of the Bible, found the first T, or Tav, and from that T, count 49 letters, the next one will be the Hebrew equivalent of an O, and 49 more will be the Hebrew equivalent of an R, and the 49 more will be the Hebrew equivalent of an H, which spells Torah. Backwards, actually. Every 49 letters from the first Tav in the first two books of the Bible spells Torah over and over and over again. The third book of the Bible, Leviticus, does not have it. So the first book you're thinking, well, that's pretty weird. The second book you're thinking, that's, that's, that's kind of crazy. There's a conspiracy going on. Third book, it's not there. You're like, Phew. For a minute there, I thought I was going nuts. But the fourth book, if you do it in reverse, find the first H and count 49 letters, you'll spell Torah backwards. So the first two books are written this way and the second two books are written this way. That's four books. The fifth book doesn't have it. But if you find the first Yud and count 49 letters, you'll find a hey, count 49 letters, you'll find a vav, count 49 letters, you'll find a hey, yud hey vav hey. That's the secret word of God. That's his name. So the first five books of the Bible, which are the law, are all pointing to God. The Bible always points to the word of God. That's amazing. That's not even coincidentally possible. If you don't believe me, write a 50-page book and try to make every 49th letter, which, by the way, is 7 squared. 7, 7, 7. 7 squared. That's every 49 letters. Try to make it say a word and not miss once in the whole book. That's only 50 pages. This happens in four books of the Bible, both forwards and backwards. And in the middle, every 49th letter is yud heh vav -Hey, which is the secret word of God. There's more. There's more information in the first sentence of the Bible than you ever even imagined was possible. We'll get into that another day. I'll break that down for you on another day. But it is fascinating what it actually says in Hebrew and what the meaning, the numerology, and all of that means. It's fascinating to know that all throughout the Bible, it constantly refers to future events that eventually happen that they couldn't have known about. You understand that it wasn't written by one guy. It was written by many guys, most of whom were writing letters to other guys, and they got included. The rest of them were in prison or on the run, and they managed to write these things down and get it out, and they were later compiled into a book. They weren't all a book to start with. It took roughly 2,500 years to compile the Bible into a book. Uh, every time you read Jesus and he says, it is written, or isn't it written? He's referring to a particular scroll or a particular book that was later compiled into the Bible. It was not all together at that time. Yet, 
consistently it predicts the future down to the details for example in Psalms it predicts what happens to Jesus right down to the fact that they're gambling over his clothing what day it happened on who it was that was fighting for his clothing gambling over his clothing the fact that he had a, a crown of thorns the fact that he's pierced his sides that none of his bones were broken but his shoulder was dislocated the fact that he dies on a cross and the fact that he's the son of God and what he says for his last words now, even if you bought that all of that was recreated by Jesus so that he could fulfill the prophecy I promise you his last words would not be thinking about what was said 2,000 years ago. It's not even possible. We'll see you later, T-Bone. Thanks for joining. These videos are up full time, so you don't have to watch it live if you don't want to. You can watch it later. Leave me a comment, and we'll see you next time. Next time, come a little earlier, and we'll play some music for you. Now, The last thing he said was, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did he say that? He wasn't asking why God forsook him. He was teaching. His last words were reminding you that the prophecy in Psalms ended with that phrase. He's actually completing the whole thing. He's completing the prophecy by saying those words. And then he dies. That's amazing that he even knew to say that let alone that he did say it because 2,000 years ago it was written in a book as a song by David his great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather one of his grandfathers anyway since 2,000 years ago so probably a couple of grandfathers down David was a king at one time and he wrote the very words that Christ would say 2,000 years later on the cross as he was dying in the form of a song. All of this ties together with the fact that this book is trustworthy. That's why I'm bringing it all up. I'm pointing to different things that, that show you beyond a shadow of a doubt in any court of law, this will hold up. It'll hold up every time. That's why I lean so heavily on it when I'm studying everything else. When I study science, when I study history, when I study philosophy, when I study biology, I first consult the Bible because it always has something to say about what I'm studying and it's always been right thus far. I've yet to find it be wrong. So trust in it if you want to. If you're the kind of person that does some studying, look there first and you'll find out that whatever you're studying will become easier to understand because it's all written down in a way you can understand it. Now, we've gone through the code. We've gone through redshift. We've gone through the fact that Einstein's an idiot. How do I know that Einstein is incorrect? As above, so below. This is a pagan statement. This is a occult statement type statement that's from other worshipers of other things but it holds true because it's correct as above so below everything that's above is exactly like it is below only you can carry it deeper if you look into the macro into an atom you will see that an atom is built just like the universe is it has a nucleus and it has protons and neutrons and other things flying around that nucleus just like a universe, like a solar system. And the solar system flies around the universe just like that. And the universe does whatever it does around whatever it does just like that. No matter how big you get into the macro, no matter how small you get into the micro, it's always the same image. It always has been and always will be, no matter what you're looking for. So that way you can give an accurate guess as to what's above us, because you can look below us. You can see into an atom with the right you know electron microscopes and stuff you can see the the structure of an atom so you can use that as a comparison to what's above us that's how I know how the universe is built how it's put together 
also you'll notice that those atoms are vibrating. It's one of the reasons they can't get a clear picture of one because it vibrates and they can't, you know, when you get into quantum, things get weird. So either it's vibrating or it'll disappear when they look at it. Whose brilliant idea was that, by the way? Some genius in a college said out loud in front of other people, he said this. It's only there when I look at it. As soon as I look away, it's not there anymore. I'll leave you with that. It's like Schrodinger's cat. You take a cat, you put the cat in a box, and in the box with the cat, you put a cesium atom. Close the lid. Adam has a 50-50% chance of throwing off, you know, some radiation and becoming radioactive. 50-50% chance. So, while the lid's closed, the cat is both dead and alive. Unless, of course, you shake the box and the cat goes, meow. I'm just saying. These idiots actually think like this. Adam is only there when I observe it. My observing it changes its behavior. Hmm. Let's think about that until Friday. That's where I'm going to stop tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. I hope that I've entertained you. Are you not entertained? I hope. And uh, I'll have some more prepared for you Friday. And see if we can't get going on some stuff. If you guys have a request... If you'd like to talk about something in particular, please let me know. My email is jakejohnsonband at gmail.com or you can leave me a comment on one of these videos and I will promptly get to studying the thing you want to talk about and we'll talk about it. Get it now while it's hot because I suspect that in the future I'm going to have quite a list of things to follow up on. So, please like, subscribe, and share this video if you feel compelled to help out the musician. The man who's doing the stuff, paypal.me slash Jake Johnson Band, or follow one of the links in the description below, buy a t-shirt, or, you know, whatever is on there. It's good stuff, good quality stuff. Some folks have already bought some. It's already nice. It's already moving. Like, subscribe, share, send me an email, and check me out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 830. And until Friday... Have a great night. See y'all then.